Right. Thank you very much for waiting. Welcome to the British Library, obviously the home of punk rock. Uh, and I'm sure that there are mixed feelings about whether the British Library, 40 years on from the birth of punk, should or shouldn't be doing this. But uh, the fact remains, whether you like it or not, the library was collecting punk 40 years ago, in 1976. So a lot of what you see in the exhibition today has been collected over that time. So all the vinyl, pretty much, the fanzines, the lights of sniffing glue, love and lovingly bound up in leather by the British Library curators for future generations to enjoy, um, has been augmented with fantastic loans from all sorts of places, letters, posters, ephemera, fashion, and some fantastic photography. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen it already, but it is open all night. So in the interval and at the end, do have another look around if you haven't um, seen it already tonight. So we're very, very delighted to be teaming up tonight with uh, Faber Social to present a really special night of discussions. Faber Social is a monthly event run by Faber and Faber Publishers, and it's a fantastic occasion to celebrate music, culture, literature, ideas, and so do look it up. So we're very, very happy to be doing this together with them tonight, and they're two great authors. So tonight you're going to hear first from uh, John Savage talking to uh, arts editor of the New Statesman, Kate Mossman, Little break after that, and then we'll have Viv Albertine, and then they'll both be up for a question and answer session at the end. If I could ask you, just a little point of order, when you uh, leave your seats at the break or whatever, to take your glasses back to the bar, that'd be a great help. Anyway, really nice to see you all. Enjoy the evening, and please welcome to the stage John Savage and Kate Mossman. <laughs> Hello, John. Hello, Kate. <laughs> Hello, you all. Thanks very much for coming. Nice turnout. See, we both have our Remain badges on. Yes, we both got our Vote Remain badges on. I voted Remain. I saw, a, um, I saw a, an old documentary on punk that said, you've got to remember it was a completely different time. You know, Britain felt like a small island. <laughs> the Oops. far right was trying to get rid of the immigrants. <laughs> And the politicians looked like they walk out of 1940, and I thought, it hasn't changed that much, has it? Do you want the short rant or the long rant? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, I'm, I'm afraid during the last few days I felt ashamed to be British. And I have to say that I find the whole thing completely disgusting. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's not a mandate for the changes that are going to occur. The Leave people have no idea of what's going to happen to them, and I'm afraid will probably happen to the rest of us. And while I may very well have to live with the consequences of the vote, I do not and never will accept it. Good stuff. And I never thought I'd have to live through this crap again. I lived through it with Mrs. Satcher for so many years, and now it's all come back even worse. And can't this bloody country get used to the idea that it's lost its empire? I thought that that was something that punk rock was supposed to be talking about <laughs> 40 years ago. But we have flotillas on the Thames again, don't yes. we? So, right. Yeah, um, in, in a great way it kind of makes what we're going to talk about even more relevant um, today. And I wondered if, um, I wanted to take you right back, because I've heard you say before that your attachment to punk and your interest in it was completely instinctual. Yes. And I wonder if you could tell me a bit about the young man that got sucked oh, God, into this no. movement. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. All the gory details. No, no, thank you, Kate. Um, well, I think, first off, if you... I mean, I got into all this and writing through music because I love music and was and still am a pop fan from an early age. To me, pop music was the way that I interpreted the world. I was born in 1953. When I was 12, 13, in 1966, I was living in Ealing, suburb of West London, listening to Pirate Radio obsessively, and that really was what created my world. Um, by 1975, I think, like a lot of people who got involved with punk rock, I knew that something was going to happen, and I knew that I wanted to be part of what was going to happen. Um, and people are always asking me about this and saying, well, why did punk rock happen? And they say, oh, well, it's the dreadful excesses of prog rock. And it wasn't. It was dreadful, dreadful, dreadful pop music in 1976. And there's a wonderful Buzzcocks lyric where Pete Shelley, Pete Shelley sings, how I hate modern music, disco boogie and pop. It goes on and on and on and on and on. How I wish it would stop. 
And so that was the punk basically came about to begin with because there was a need for a 70s kind of rock music, a truly 70s rock music that had nothing to do with the 60s and didn't appear with the 60s as they had become, which is, you know, I'm afraid, Wings triple albums, and <laughs> was also to do with, um, you know, dreadful records like I've Got a Com Brand New Combine Harvester by Edge Cutler and the Wurzels, <laughs> or Save Your Kisses for Me by the Brotherhood of Man. Do you remember that, anybody? That made you want to throw up. <laughs> Um, and it was number one for six weeks. So that, and again for me, and I, I said this before at the opening night, I knew something was going to happen. I read a piece by Charles Shaw Murray, in the, who's a wonderful writer in the NME in November 75, where he talked about the CBGB scene. And this is pre-internet, pre-social media, pre-everything, so you had to get scraps of information from wherever you could. And he wrote a paragraph about the Ramones, and he said they went one, two, three, four, at the start of every number, they had birds, sunglasses, their songs all lasted 90 seconds, and they were all I wanna or I don't wanna. I thought, right, that's it. That's 70s rock music. I love the idea, sorry, go on. Sorry, no, no. I love the idea that um, this was an age, of course, where you, you read about the music before you heard it. Yeah. And I know this, that's something that Viv mentioned in her book as well, going to buy the, the Patti Smith record and hoping that it was actually as good as, as the yes. pieces of criticism said it was. Yes, I bought it because of the cover. The cover's wonderful, taken by Robert Ma Maplethorpe, and I wasn't disappointed. And I wasn't disappointed by the Ramones either, which completely changed my work. So I had the, bought the record before I saw the Sex Pistols. So, um, and as a young man, 22, 23, um, yeah, I was pretty much a mess. Um, I, was I taking drugs? Uh, not many by that stage. Um, I'm gay, so I was gay then, and then being gay in 1976 was pretty bloody awful. Um, the main role models were Larry Grayson and John Inman. Uh, are you being served, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I have his album, by the way, it's really great. <laughs> um, and so, and I was doing a job that I hated, and I thought that I would never get to be the person that I wanted to be, and I felt very alienated and isolated, and then I found punk rock. Thank you, punk rock. Tell me a little bit about the idea of, um, I think one of the things that we've, we've lost a little now uh, is the sense of a generation gap, because yes. little kids now are having their parents yes. going, you must hear the Smiths, this is yes. where it's at. And it can't have been fun having a... I mean, Generation Gap, to me, sounds kind of exciting because there was no. something to kick against, but no. it wasn't, was it? No, and I'm very happy now that... I mean, I don't have children, but my friends of my age have got children, or slightly younger, they've got teenage children. They seem to be so much closer to their children than I was to my parents. There's a complete Generation Gap. My parents did not get it whatsoever. Um, it was a complete disaster because um, they, were, of course, were... My father was born in 18, my mother was born in 28, so they were pre-pop culture. They didn't get it at all. They were the wartime generation, um, and so that was a major source of difference. But I have to say that my mum, who's 87, came to the exhibition uh, last week, and she bought one of those, um, here's a chord, here's another, now former band T-shirt, and she's wearing <laughs> it at home. <laughs> Do, do you remember the first night that you felt that you'd found something new? Yes, very strongly. Um, it was seeing the clash at Fulham Town Hall right at the end of October 76. And that night I had taken drugs, I'm afraid to say. And I'd met Polly Starring, Marie Elliott, as she was called, in the same evening. And Marie and I went to see the clash at Fulham Town Hall. And within five seconds, that was it. I knew exactly this is what I'd been waiting for, and I'd found it, and it was happening in front of my eyes. And what was interesting about The Clash then um, was that everybody thinks of The Clash in terms of machismo because of their later um, image. But in fact, The Clash seemed to me then, they're all in their paint-spattered hand-me-downs, and they seemed to me to be like hurt and scared boys. And I found that very interesting. They weren't macho at all. They were actually sort of quite damaged and almost sort of um, almost pathetic, and they were just trying to rise above it. I thought that was very interesting. Mm. How did it feel different from having seen um, larger rock bands in the past? Did you feel closer to them physically, emotionally? Yes. Well, I mean, it was a small place, so, you know, a lot of punk events in the first year were held in small clubs, which to me is a fantastic place to see. I've never been a festival person. I don't like them, too many people. Um, and I've never liked arena shows um, either. I went to see a lot in the 80s. Um, and clubs, ballrooms, theatres, you know, that's the place to see groups. And yes, obviously, you could be very, very close to 
you could be right up in front of the stage. It wasn't that crowded then. The first time I saw the Sex Pistols, shortly afterwards, I started at the back of the crowd because I wasn't sure. By the third song, I was right at the front, on the, you know, right next to the stage, and it was possible to do that. And that, of course, is fantastic because you're seeing the whites of their eyes and they're seeing the whites of your eyes. And I think one of the things that happened to the Sex Pistols is that they had this very close contact with the audience who, I, who mirrored them very strongly, either hating them or loving them. Mm. And so they had, you had this very, and it was great for groups because they had this very intense uh, relationship with the audience. Um, and they could see exactly what was happening, what was good, what was bad, or maybe they would even fight the audience, mm. which happened when I saw The Clash at the Royal College of Art. I'd never seen anybody put his guitar down and leap into the audience and start hitting somebody, which Joe Strummer <laughs> did, um, because there were students there and they were throwing glasses at the group, and quite rightly, Joe Strummer took exception. Yeah. I'd never seen anybody do that. <laughs> that was new. <laughs> One of the sort of um, uh, popular stories about punk is that it was completely London-based. Yeah. Is that a myth? Well, I was always, I mean, I was always very interested. Obviously, the first groups I saw were in London, but I was always very interested in the idea of punk being an international phenomenon anyway. Um, I didn't like the way that in 1977 um, it became an English thing, we own punk. Well, nobody owns punk, really. Um, and I always liked the fact that there were these groups who I didn't find out until about. In 77, I knew about Perubu and Electric Eels in Cleveland and the CBGB scene, then London, a bit in Paris, and then, of course, in 77, it went to the west coast of America. And I went out to the west coast of America in 78 and saw a lot of these punk bands, like the Weirdos and the Screamers, and they were just fantastic. Um, and so I was always into this... I never liked the idea of one person or one city owning it. But yes, it did start in London, but very quickly spread to, obviously, to Manchester um, in the famous Dune show, um, which actually um, is a very interesting show. And Richard Boone, who's here, was very much involved with it um, because it was pretty much the first show ever promoted by Sex Pistols fans, by people who actually liked the group. And that's one of the reasons why it's so memorable. Previously, they just played pubs and places where people hated them. And here was a, a situation <laughs> whereby they actually had fans. And this is one of the first, first times they and it started the spread mm. out to Manchester, where I lived from 1979 on. Mm. Because one of the reasons I moved there, apart from the fact I got a job there, was that I loved the punk scene there yeah. much more after a while than the London punk scene, because the London punk scene... By autumn 1977, they become very music industry, and there was a lot of cocaine. Mm. And as everyone knows, cocaine means bad art. <laughs> <laughs> In the exhibition here, we've got some um, examples of your, your, fan, your magazine oh. you're producing, Secret Public. Um, I did two fanzines. I did one called London's <laughs> Outrage, which was end of 76. Mm. And then I did another one called The Secret Public. These images that you're seeing up here are of photographs of Notting Hill and Notting Dale, West 10, West 11, yeah. West 14, taken in January 1977 for use in a fanzine. And it shows what London, some of what parts of London were like in 1977. I think what's harder for younger people to realise was just how derelict a lot of London was. Whole areas of North Kensington were completely, Covent Garden was derelict. Um, a very good record of the, of the tap of London in 1977 can be seen in Derek Jarman's Jubilee, which mm -hmm. is one of the only films to actually have been shot in that year, feature films, which, of course, the slits were briefly in. Um, they're, in they're in, you know, Viv. Uh, and Viv was in as one of the slits, smashing up a car. Um, and, of course, and the Roxy was in Covent Garden. The Roxy it? was in Covent Garden. And, of course, the market, this is, again, the dereliction, the market had just moved, the fruit market had just moved out. And so the whole point of the whole area had gone. And so there were squats there. Chrissy Hind had a squat in Covent Garden. I used to visit her there, just around the corner from the sounds office, which is where I used to work. And so the other thing about that time is young people could live right near the centre of the city, either for free or certainly very cheaply. And that also helped that culture, which, of course, is impossible now. Yes, that, that meant, and also you could sign on, you could live yes. for free, you could sign on, and then you could actually write, write music and get involved. Yes, and, of course, successive governments, particularly beginning in the... 80s with Thatcher have taken those possibilities and those freedoms away, mm. to which leads us to the situation that we're in now. 
So tell me a bit about your, your fanzines. What was the idea behind the, the secret public? I mean, the, the imagery that you were using in that was very different to the kind of angry guys with guitars thing that's gone down in history as being the, the front face of punk in some ways. Well, obviously, being gay, I was interested in non-standard ma uh, masculinity even then, and I was interested in gender difference and different aspects of gender. Um, and so, for instance, one of my favourite male punk bands was Subway Sect because they were a bit hopeless. And I liked the fact that Vic would come out on stage and kind of go, <laughs> that was great, that was so exciting and so liberating because it wasn't, you know. And um, so, um, and at that point, I was reconstructing recently, um, the gay movement wasn't so well organized. It really got itself organized. It was in existence, obviously, but it was much more organized in the 80s onwards, whereas second wave of feminism, feminism was already up and running. And so I teamed up with an artist called Linda Sterling, um, who, was, um, who still remains a fine artist, very well-known fine artist and performance artist. Um, and we did a magazine called Secret Public, which was all montages, no words except captions to the montages. Um, and that was a way, I saw montage as being a fantastic way of assimilating data very quickly. Um, you could put lots of stuff in there. Yeah. And also montage had suggested itself to me by seeing the punks at the very early shows I went to, because um, what happened if you went to shows in 76 or even early 77, the kids would be wearing, the audience would be wearing 50, 40s, 50s and 60s clothes all put together and mashed up with safety pins. And they almost looked like a living collage of, of youth culture history, which to me was just completely fantastic. Um, and I was also very influenced um, partly, partly by, you know, Linda as well, whose mm -hmm. work I thought and still think is fantastic. And also um, in compendium books, does anybody remember compendium? Yes. <laughs> they sold very cheaply um, at publications by a publisher called Beach Books. And they had a lot of um, montage magazines in them by people like Claude Pellier and also there was John Hartfield. Mm. And so we did this magazine, Richard Boone, thank you very much helped to get it printed and put it out on Buzzcock's label, New Hormones, and um, it sold <laughs> very few. <laughs> because, uh, because we didn't put a price on it, because we were so out of our minds, in a good way. So people just took it for free? Presumably. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other um, uh, fanzines that they have down there says on the front, um, guaranteed 100% stranglers free. Oh. <laughs> Oh. What does that mean? Explain to us what that means. Um, well, there was a bit of a split going on, wasn't there? <laughs> um, that's very provocative of you, Kate. Um, oh dear, I've got into so much trouble with all this over the years. Um, I really, really dislike the Stranglers. Um, I thought they were everything that punk rock was supposed not to be. And I didn't actually think they were punk rock. People now say they're punk rock and Stranglers fans say, you wrote the Stranglers out of punk rock history. But actually, I never thought they were part of punk rock history. They were something different, and they came along, and they profited from the space that punk had opened up. Fair enough. Doesn't mean I have to like them, I don't. And they were a bit later as well, weren't they? No, they were going well before punk. They were doing the festival circuit in 75. Mm. But I thought they were bullies. You had a run-in, didn't you? I had a run-in, yeah. <laughs> and I don't like bullies, so. And I don't think many people here probably like bullies. There's a lot of, um, uh, again, in the way that people tell the story about, about punk, there's a, a sense of it suddenly becoming commercialised at the yes. point when um, the, uh, the Jubilee happened and yes. the Sex Pistols boat went down the Thames. Yes. Um, you don't feel that way about that moment, do you? Um, I thought it had got, by the autumn awesome of 77, I was no longer particularly interested in, in London punk, as it had been, because I thought there were lots of horrible groups coming out. I remember one, I remember there was one particular, two particular groups that I saw pictures of and I thought, uh-oh, this is all going wrong. A group called London and a group called the Maniacs. And they just looked like old geezers who had their hair cut short, playing sped up pub rock, which is not the idea. And also, the Sex Pistols, I'd been on the boat trip, the Sex Pistols boat trip, which to me was the climactic moment of the whole thing. And I still am in awe of what the Sex Pistols did, really, because they were very, very brave. Um, it would be like somebody coming out now and playing an anti-Brexit gig in the middle of, you know, Parliament Square. Mm. Um, 
because they were the only people to protest the Queen's Jubilee. And the Queen's Jubilee in 1977 was worth protesting for this, exactly the same idea that it's worth protesting Brexit now in that it was an attempt to roll back this country in, into some ridiculous fantasy, we won the war, we still got an empire type crap. Tell me a bit about what the atmosphere on that day was like as it well. It was really heavy. It was awful. Um, it was, everybody, a lot of people on the boat were taking speed. Um, there were people doling out speed. And speed is not a particularly uh, good drug for the head, really. Um, and the weather was awful, as per. And it just felt like the summation of something. All stuck on the boat. I've never been on a boat trip since. Mm. I won't go on boat trips. Because <laughs> you're stuck there, you can't get off. Um, and you stop there for hours. And so they played, and it was all very difficult and very noisy, but very exciting. And then the boat, they played Anarchy in the UK outside the Houses of Parliament, which is a wonderful moment, never forget that. And then the police came round, police launches, boat comes in, serried ranks of police, riot, end all, really. Mm. It was very, very... Um, and I just always thought with the Sex Pistols, what is the problem? They're just a pop group, you mm. know, and they're actually saying what they think. And um, God Save the Queen is a fantastic record. It's probably one of the best rock and roll records ever. Um, and so what's the problem? But the extraordinary thing about the Sex Pistols at that moment, and this is why I think they were very brave, is that they were the only people to actually stand up and say, this is a load of bollocks, which it was. And they were the only people, that record, um, God Save the Queen, was, it was really difficult to press. People objected to the covers. They objected to pressing the record. Um, they objected to distributing it. No radio played it, except for once on John Peel. No adverts on commercial radio, nothing on the BBC. Um, effectively made number one was kept off the charts by some music industry finagling in the shops in Smith's where they had all the records racked. It wasn't even on the rack, even though it was number two. So there was a concerted attempt by the establishment to stop this record. Now, I still find that absolutely incredible. Yeah. Just a pop record. What was the problem? It's incredible to think that music at that point had such power to shock and offend. But and all they were doing was telling the truth. Yeah. And That's could what's that, so weird. It couldn't happen now, could it? You couldn't get... I don't know. I um, wonder whether well, it's Well, this is something, something we can maybe talk about later. Well, yeah, yeah maybe it's about the, the, the sort of power of music having been downgraded on some level, that it's not, it doesn't have that, you know, if, you, if, you, if a band turned up on a live TV and swore now, their entire tour would not be cancelled as half the Sex Pistols tour was. I think that punk, certainly to me, was a product of scarcity and focus. And I think um, scarcity, because there wasn't much youth media, there wasn't much actual pop music worth the name. Most of the people involved with punk, probably born between 52 and 58, had all grown up through the 60s and had been used to this idea that pop music was completely fabulous and was actually saying something and was involved with some idea of counterculture and some kind of autonomous youth culture. Um, and that had gone, effectively, by mm. 1976. So I think that everybody involved with punk wanted that to happen mm. Mm. in whatever way they, they could. Um, and I think that, you know, that's why, in one reason, why it's still celebrated. Yes. It was quite spontaneous. It wasn't put together. And there was so little happening. I mean, I, these pictures I took of Notting Hill and Notting Dale, there were 35 in the set. And, um, oh, incidentally, in case you hate punk being in the libraries and the museums, there's a set in the Tate, OK? And, um, and also, in case you hate being, punk being in the museums, what do you want in the museums? Do you want Adge Cutler? Do you want Brotherhood of Man in the museums? Please tell me. <laughs> Maybe we can arrange it. Um, so, and it was, I think, McLaren and Westwood um, did fantastically well to focus everything so hard and with such clear lines in their shop. And I actually don't think they've got enough credit for that. Um, I thought what they did was extraordinary mm. um, in areas problematic, which I could talk about for hours, but that simple thing of focus everything, like the Sex Pistols did, like Jamie did on their record sleeves, it's so clear and complicated ideas expressed in a simple way mm. that people could readily understand. I thought that was fantastic. And the best punk groups, another classic example being the Buzzcocks and Linda Sterling's sleeve, 
for the orgasmatic single, which is probably my actual favourite piece of art in the whole punk period. I just think it's completely fantastic. I was wondering about you know, things like the Tits T-shirt yeah. from the Sex. How prevalent was the Tits T-shirt? How many people out of 20 had that? <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably not that many. Um, how much did it cost? <laughs> probably cost too much. People were always upset about how much those clothes cost. But <laughs> I was never worried, really. I've still got one of those mohair five colour, electric colour mohair sweaters, which are absolutely <laughs> stringy mohair sweaters. <laughs> Fabulous. I, I interviewed um, Johnny Rotten once and he said, uh, he said, Vivian's clothes were always awful. She had no concept of men's dangly bits. <laughs> he said, all those zips and all those safety pins. Well, no, I mean, I like the, I had, when I worked in television in my first year, I had a pair of the sex corduroy, seditionist corduroy trousers which were beautiful striped corduroy. And then they had a zip that went right from here, right round the arse. <laughs> and I got into terrible trouble where I thought they were great. <laughs> great for women. <laughs> they yeah, can take a piss anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I liked Vivian's clothes. And I do, I've got a lot of time, I've got a lot of time for her clothes. Mm. I think they're great. And I still think some of her clothes are great. I think a lot of what those guys do now is they're still provoking. I mean, we, we interviewed um, Vivian for the New Statesman and she said, oh, punk was just a marketing opportunity. And you don't say that kind of thing unless you want to annoy a lot of people. No, <laughs> I can't be bothered now. I just want to celebrate it, really, yeah, and, yeah. Be, and be, try and be as truthful as possible. And also it helps me to th still think about it. It was a very formative part of my life and it helped doing these things helps me to still think about it and to make it new and to keep on making it interesting for myself and hopefully other people. Mm. I can't be bothered to be provocative, you mm. know, all that sort of burning Sex Pistols clothes thing. Yeah. It's not a good look, is it? Who else has done it in history? <laughs> How did you first feel when you saw this movement that you loved starting to be associated with violence and scuffles? Well, it was country? inevitable because punk mirrored England. It was actually a very, very it was very in tune with what was going on. It was a true mirror of the country, which is why I call the book England's Dreaming and why God Save the Queen was so powerful. It really did, and it mirrored also the unconscious of the country. It actually went very deep in certain aspects. Some of the best groups went very, very deep. And, and I mean, I'll reel out the, be the best groups. Um, Buzzcocks, Early Clash, Sex Pistols, Susie, The Slits, um, Subway Sect, adverts, all of those groups really said something about the place and the time that they were in, in a very profound way. And I think they, they made great art as it happens. Mm. Um, and that's what great art does. Um, it takes you into the time, it helps you to get out of the time. Mm. And so um, I, I have to say I did get irritated when um, but I did get, you know, the violent, but the violence in, in British society then and this is what worries me about what's happening now. The violence then was completely endemic. I keep on telling younger people like yourself how violent everything was. In retrospect, it was really scary. And I now think I must have had a guardian angel looking over me because I didn't get into serious trouble then, but I could easily have done, and I like, like that. And um, obviously there was the National Front, um, who were worse than the UKIP of their day, and they were having, I saw some footage recently, and there was massed marches, and then massed anti-marches, and huge pitch, pitched battles. Um, and punk gigs were so violent sometimes. Um, mm. You know, like I told you about the Clash one, I went to, I, you know, there was another one, what was the other one? Wire, um, Bruce Gilbert of Wire told me about playing in Newcastle, and this guy just came down, all the punks were there, walked through the city hall, Klu Klux Klan hood over his head um, and just started beating the crap out of people. And that was the sort of thing that would happen mm. as a matter of course. And we were all used to it. And I really hope that nobody ever has to get used mm. to that again. It was really awful. Were you, so you were at, say, the, the, the rainbow um, gig by The Clash when the chairs were being thrown yes. at the stage and everything? And... Well, my ultimate experience of that was seeing The Clash at November at the Apollo in Manchester and I was in the press pit because I was a writer for Sounds by then and the only other person in the press pit was a photographer called Kevin Cummins and the crowd were deconstructing the theatre by pulling all the chairs out and throwing them at the band. This was the way that they expressed their love <laughs> and as well as spitting, that was the other way. 
And um, I was in the press pit, dodging all these chairs, <laughs> sailing over the front of the audience. And I remember looked at Mick, I looked at Mick Jones, who was up there playing, and he was just going, what the fuck is going on? What have we done? It was all mad. So yeah. they triggered some punk group, groups triggered something in a way that they didn't necessarily know was there. Mm. And that's always fascinating. Mm. What was, what was the spitting about? I mean, in its essence. <laughs> <laughs> well, Be well, you could say it's like a long distance kiss. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't totally aggressive, was it? It was pretty disgusting. <laughs> uh, I would not have liked to have been in a band then. Um, there's a wonderful, I'm sure Viv might tell you about that because I don't know whether, did you get gobbed at? Yeah, she got gobbed at. <laughs> she may tell you about how awful that was. I can't imagine what it must have been like. Um, it was just weird. <laughs> it was, there was a side of punk that was very Dickensian um, and very sort of urchin-like and very sort of, it was like, you know, the phlegm of the Industrial Revolution, all this horrible stuff coming out and being expelled, unfortunately, at the, at the groups. <laughs> And there's a wonderful piece of footage of the clash that Granada took. And there they are all on stage being fabulous and, you know, ah! and suddenly there's a big dose of flob on the camera lens. And you just think, oh my God, you can hardly see anything from that camera and that camera shuts down. <laughs> I've seen footage of um, uh, Pauline from penetration oh, yeah. of those early gigs being I don't know if it's beer or if it's spit but I think it's one of the first gigs that they did and it's right in the face and you just think I wonder if a, if a punk band would actually ultimately be offended if they weren't spat on after a while because it meant they weren't a real punk band I think they'd have been happy not to be in Kate I think having flob on the strings doesn't really help you hit the nose <laughs> and also on your clothes I wouldn't like to be would anybody here like to be gobbed on no no thanks yeah one there <laughs> <laughs> of a, um, a threat to the establishment was it really seen as punk? Well, I think that, of course, one always tends to over-dramatise this, um, being young and um, full of energy and full of wish to change things, which I think is a wonderful thing that should be encouraged uh, in youth, because youth are the future, and if they don't have positive ideas about the future, then we're not going to have a future. Um, and again, this is one of the very serious things about this country at the minute, in that youth are completely undervalued and disregarded, most notably in regard to the Leave vote, um, which is a kind of mass sort of generational betrayal, as far as I'm concerned. By the way, my badge, I voted Remain, OK? <laughs> and um, so, but I think it's easy to overestimate it. On the other hand, I go back to what I said about the Sex Pistols. Why did everybody try and stop this record? Mm. And a lot of punk records were banned. For instance, another one that was banned, which was again one of my favourites, was Buzzcock's Org Orgasm Addict, because it's one of the funniest and the truest songs about sex ever written. Now, to be funny about sex is absolutely incredible, and particularly in a song that only lasts two minutes. Um, but it was banned. It was able to be printed, but uh, radio, you know, radio wouldn't play it. Mm. It was effectively kept off the airwaves. Mm. And quite a few punk songs were, because they were seen as being beyond the boundaries of taste. Mm. Um, and I think there was a sense in which, I always think that punk told a number of truths um, about this country, particularly, you know, the punk we're talking about, London punk in particular, and British punk, told a number of truths about this country that people did not want to hear. And again, I think that was very brave. I have enormous respect for the musicians who went up and played and stood up for what they believed in in the face of quite a lot of hostility in the early days. Mm. What do you think some of the biggest misconceptions about punk are? Because the story is told a particular way. Yes, well, we all go around the houses on this, don't we? Um, I think that a lot of pop history now is seen in terms of personal experience and generational nostalgia, which I, as a historian, I find incredibly tedious and tried. Mm. So um, I'm not interested, really, in when, whether somebody went to see The Clash with his mates from school and they missed the last bus to No Dear. Um, and I'm always interested, when I watch programmes about pop culture and culture in general, in a bit of analysis, a bit of abstract thought, a bit of research, a bit of intelligence. Mm. Um, and I thought that early punk was fantastically intelligent. Um, that seems to be a misconception. Um, another misconception which I always get 
um, because I'm, I was brought up middle class moving to upper middle class is that I'm posh and don't have any right to talk about punk. Well, <laughs> um, and if you want to get, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but if you want to be really authentic about punk, I'm a gay man, look at the uh, historical definition of punk, um, look it up, I'm authentic, okay? <laughs> We were thinking at the beginning about the, um, uh, the situation in the country now and yes. the kind of um, uh, feeling that has been present here in the last two or three weeks. Yes. And I was wondering whether you feel that something like punk could happen again. I would certainly like to see, and in any way I can help, um, people protesting against what's happened. I certainly do not regard there is a mandate for the huge changes that are going to occur. I personally feel that the vote was um, partially stolen by intimidation and very serious and admitted lies, and that this actually is a very, very serious moment in the life of our country. I feel very, very strongly about it. I can't sleep. Um, to me, this is the biggest crisis we've had for a long, long time. I think that will inevitably mean protests, and I hope that it does, because right at the minute, it doesn't look as though the government is going to listen. Um, and so I think people have got to stand up for themselves. Mm. And I would hope also that some culture would come out of that. This is probably the first time that people under probably about your age have ever mm. faced something like yes, this. Yeah. Um, and this is going to be a big change for people like your, of your age. And it's your age who, in a way, are going to be as much out on the streets as anybody else and mm. as much wanting to create a culture of dissent, um, which to me is incredibly unnecessary. I do see parallels now. I wouldn't have seen it earlier on in the year between now and 1976, 77. And I'm, what worries me, what terrifies me, is that we're going to go back to the instability of those years and the violence of those years and the general sense of England being very, very mean. Mm. I wonder about you. You were talking about the, uh, it's, um, the younger generation that have been left uh, voiceless by Brexit. And... I wonder if there, if there could be a cultural movement in the same way. For instance, would it be located in music, for example, or art? Could, it, could that happen now in the same way? I think in a way say? that's something I'd like to talk to the audience about. Mm. I just regard my job now, I'm 62, as helping mm. in any way. Mm. As rather, I, you know, I think, I, I think in a way that's what I'd like to hear from the audience and any younger people here. Mm. And maybe, I mean, what do you think, Kate? Well, I, I sort of suspect that um, possibly because our attachment to music is different. It's less, um, we don't rush out and buy records that we've read a review of and, you know, travel back on the bus with them and listen to them intensively overnight in quite the same way that we did 40 years ago. And I wonder whether that is still, that would be the outlet for that kind of... I mean, I was interested in um, the, the way the internet has affected it as well. Um, the fact that Facebook now is the forum for people getting angry. And it's sort of just disintegrates. You know, people yes. have their little, they, they fire their thing and then it just goes into a thread. And even the um, uh, March for Europe that was set on the Tuesday of that week was cancelled because it was too large and it was like downgraded to a smaller one a few days later. And I thought, this is an interesting time to see these kind, this anger being sort of dissipated. On the other hand, I mean, I don't know, I'm always hopeful. And part of me thinks that rock music is so bad now <laughs> that it's actually up for grabs. I watched Tea in the Park the other night on telly and I saw the Red Hot Chili Papers. Please, somebody. They're probably the worst group I've ever seen in my life. They run a close second, maybe, to Mumford and Sons. It's between those two. And I just despaired. And the only people I saw doing it, because I don't go to festivals, but I do watch them on telly like everybody else. I have to say, I saw New Order or Glastonbury and they were fantastic and they really lifted my spirits. It was the day after the vote. And here was a group that had begun in Manchester, mm. had taken from European music and American music and combined them all, and they were an in, and black American music, and they were an international act. And they showed an EU flag at the end. Mm. And I think it's very, I personally, I think in my darker moments about all this, which are quite frequent, I see a lot of this vote, and a lot of what's happening politically as a determined attempt to roll back all the freedoms and the rights that people have worked for and lived with happily for the last 40 years. 
And so to stop that happening, people really do need to do something about it. Mm. <laughs> I guess I wanted to ask you as well, do you still feel punk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the only records I've been able to play, it's really sad, isn't it, since Brexit, have been MC5 back in the USA, uh, Skip Spence Orr, because it's so sad. Um, and I got a copy of the first Ramones album, and they've done a mono mix, and it's super crunchy and super fantastic. And I go upstairs and write all these angry emails and do all my work, and I just have... I don't want to go down to the basement on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, it's really sad. <laughs> so you feel that anger is the key part of, of keeping your punkness? Well, no. I, turn it round. I think it's mirroring my anger at what's mm. happened. And I don't like being angry. It's mm. not good for me. Mm. Um, but yes, it's the only music I can really hear. And a bit of dub reggae yeah. when I need to cool out. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm just playing my old favourites, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and I'm certainly uh, not playing Muse. <laughs> or Mumford. Or Mumford, yeah. Honestly, how far has it gone down, really, seriously? <laughs> what do you think, uh, just almost in terms of a, a recommendation for us, what, what are some of the great lost punk records? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I love a group called, from Akron called the Bizarros. Um, and they did a wonderful LP just called The Bizarros and a single called Going Underground. I love Kleenex, who are a Swiss all-female punk group. Uh, as Viv's here, and I do, and Tessa are here, I'm going to say I love the John Peel version of FM by The Slits, which I just think is incredible. Um, what other obscure punk... I love the... Well, it's not obscure, but I love it. The first Saints album, uh, which is a wonderful record. Um, and um, obviously the sub subway sector records from the period. Um, and when I'm feeling really frivolous, <laughs> I really like um, Saplan for Pour Moi by Plastic Bertrand, <laughs> 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 which was turned into this really w weird gay record by Elton Mortello called Jet Boy, Jet Girl. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I, I keep on, uh, occasionally I keep on hearing things. My friends send me stuff. Yeah, but, do you uh, still find yourself discovering new records that you didn't hear at the time? Not many. I used, mm. to, I used to write for Sounds, and I used to get so many records sent to me every week, and I'd take most of them down to Honest John's and get 13th Floor Elevator albums. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long we've got, but I was wondering whether we... How are we doing, John? Five. Five minutes. So we're going to do um, uh, some Q&A a bit later on um, with Viv as well. I was going to say we could, we could do it now, but... Um, Let's do it later on with yeah. both here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to think if I have anything else burning that I wanted to, to ask you, actually. Um, I'm trying to think of any... Oh, a, a record that I didn't really know at the time. I tend to like the more fun punk stuff now. I really, I've, recently I found the Boys album and I really, really enjoyed it. Mm. And I read Andrew Matheson's book, I'm Sick of You, which is so helpless and squalid. I really enjoyed that, too. Um, <laughs> and uh, what was the other record I found? Oh, I can't remember. Um, but yes, no, I still very occasionally, but it's more... Um, I don't find that many old records now that I... Mm. Want. I'm still interested in new records, but new records I like are electronic. I like electronic music. And I've just done a very interesting interview with a young woman in her 20s who was telling me all about grime, and that was really interesting. Mm, mm. Um, well, when we were speaking um, before, you, you said something which really resonated with me about the idea that you started going to these gigs and you found yourself talking to complete strangers yes. more openly than to the people that you knew at home yes. among your friends. Tell yes, me a bit about I lost, that. Well, because I'm at the upper age range, because I was 22, 20, turning 23 in... Um, 1976. I was younger than Joe Strummer, okay? <laughs> and um, and um, the punk generation was basically probably, I would say, 52 to 59. That was about the age mm. range. Um, so I was right at the upper, upper, upper limit. Um, and I lost almost all my friends because I was involved in this bizarre thing and they didn't get it. They were still listening to The Grateful Dead. Um, <laughs> and triple live albums. And... Um, and, well, they were listening to Little Feet. Um, and um, you remember Little Feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, for instance, I went to see The Damned in December 76. There were mm. 10 people there. 
And one of the people there was a young man called Shane. And he had this fanzine, which he just made up, called Bondage. And it was covered with safety pins and razor blades. And he said, oh, I've got this thing. What am I going to do with it? And I said, I'll photocopy at work. And so I did. And I was working in a lawyer's office. And I you know, dodged all the lawyers with this thing festooned with safety pins and got cuts all over me. And that was Shane McGowan's fanzine, Bondage. And I printed about 20 copies of it. And that was the sort of thing that would happen. Yes. So chance encounters. And then out of those encounters, there would be some bit of culture. Do you feel like the, um, the teenagers who were getting into it at that point, the, the sort of younger kids, yeah. is, would it be true to say that they'd sort of grown up with this knowledge that the 60s had this massive cultural moment and that they'd sort of missed it in yes. a funny kind of way and they didn't have their own thing? Yes, 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 very much so. And I think, you know, the disappointment, really. Um, and even, you know, you didn't have... You weren't even able to go to the Roundhouse and see a hippie band anymore. And that was entertaining, well mm. enough, you know. Hawkwind wasn't much of Hawk, even Hawkwind anymore mm. in 76. So even the alternative had gone. Um, so it was very barren. Mm. But the beauty of it, I suppose, is that you could get so much closer to these new bands that were emerging. So, you know, you see the old clubs and you're actually on the same level as them a lot of the time and you're physically close. Well, that's what gobbing was all about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Intimate contact through bodily fluids. Couldn't do it. Couldn't have done it a few, day, a few years later, not with HIV. Yeah. Um, that would have been well dodgy. So it was very much a moment in time. That is one way in which um, the younger generation now, they do have that sort of close connection to, to groups, um, you know, physically in small venues and stuff. It, there isn't that sort of sense of the bloated rock music, perhaps, that you had in the, that you inherited from the 60s. Yes. The big thing was, I think, the Rolling Stones at Earl's Court. That was a big one, um, mm. being awful. And, of course, the Rolling Stones were pretty awful by... 1976, and I'd grown up with the Rolling Stones. I loved them in the 60s. Um, but then Andrew, Logan, Andrew Lou Golden left and Brian Jones died, and they became mannered and irritating. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> fans of Exile sorry on Main Street. Um, it was the heroin years, wasn't it, and cocaine years. <laughs> I don't know. I just think that it's so strange to be still talking about it like this 40 years later, but I'm very glad that we are. Mm. And I want to re-emphasize the bravery. I have enormous respect for everyone who got up on stage in that period, even terrible bands. Um, even the Stranglers, there you are, I'm being really <laughs> generous. Um, um, because, you know, they had guts. And that's something that, and most of the people involved were actually trying to do something, were trying to shape the culture, we're trying to change the world, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Mm. And I would like to think that it could happen again in whatever forum, and I do think it needs to happen now more than ever. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>